that. Hello, where the heck's the share screen? There's that. There's that. Slideshow. Don't show me this message again. Well, <laughs> welcome everyone to the final meeting of the semester. Buddy's excited. We made it to the end of the semester somehow. Nobody knows how that happened, but we made it. So yeah. So meetings next semester, we're gonna be sending out an email tonight or tomorrow morning. I probably will send it out as, as we start the grad student panel to pick a new meeting day and time for the next semester. We wanna know early rather than later so I can start planning our other guest speakers over the break because I already have a couple wanting what day, what day? And I'm like, I don't know yet. We're leaning towards in the chat, saying something in the chat. Um, he's, he's, he's there somewhere. They're looking for you, Colin. Yeah, uh, he's cooking. He could still hear everything, but he's cooking in the other room. So anyways, we're leaning towards Thursdays at seven because our late, because usually this semester, because of dynamics, the late classes are Tuesday, Thursdays, but next semester, the late classes are Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. So we're leaning towards Thursdays at seven. So then the poll is just gonna ask, can you do Thursdays at seven, yes or no? And if not, what day? And whichever the majority wins, will win. So please fill it out as soon as you see it and keep an eye out for what we decide. We'd like to be able to figure out the day before we go to break or at the very beginning of break. And don't, don't disappoint Buddy, he's watching. He's always watching. So there's that. So for officer elections, we have a lot of senior officers graduating Anna, I don't think Anna is Anna here. Um, Anna's not here. I'll take. I'll do meeting minutes at the end. It's fine. So we have a lot of senior officers graduating, or going to be here only for an extra semester, so they're not running again. So we're gonna have a pretty big replacement of our e board. So we're going we to do officer elections a little bit earlier because we want to try to allow some training for the new officers. So they're not going to start until May. But we're going to use the Panda Express fundraiser as a way to train the officers how to actually do what they're doing. So Brian can train the new treasurer how to put in for the new event, the money, et cetera. Anna could teach the new secretary how to use Engage to send emails. And then I could teach social media how to advertise. There is a rule in our constitution that you must be at 75% of our meetings or communicate ahead of time that you could not come. We get coronas happening, but if you're someone who does not come to the meetings usually or does not communicate out to one of the officers, Please be at, make a effort to be at every meeting the next semester. We've been taking attendance via the polls and the recordings so we can go back to if there's any suspicions, but next semester we are taking a official attendance and watching way closer than we have. So please make an effort to do that. So if we see that you showed up to like the first four meetings pretty consistently and show that you actually do care, we, we won't, we'll a little bat an eye a little bit about the fall, but we need to see some initiative to allow you to be able to run. So nominations are gonna open the middle Oh, there's Anna. There she is. Well, nominations are going to open up the middle of February. Elections are going to be about early March. And the Panda Express fundraiser will be end of March or early April ish. That's an ish timeline. So if you want to run for an officer, feel free to ask any of the other officers about their positions and the, um, to keep an eye out for the nominations to open up. Anyone have any questions about that? Okay, cool. So the AMS poster, Matt is doing it. We have a few ideas what to do. To the left is the old poster. As you can see, this is pretty an old, pretty old poster based on the quality, so it needs an update. If anyone has anything that they should that they think should be on the poster, let Matt know. Matt, say hello to the people. Hi, people. Yeah, that's Matt. If you have if, if there's anything that you think we could maybe include on the poster, let Matt know in the either in a message or in the chat this meeting commences. He'll take ideas because we're submitting this into the national conference or I don't know if it's for the student for the national. I really don't know, but we're submitting this. So if anyone has ideas, please let us know. So we've had a couple members mention they would like to do maybe fun Zoom activities, a club over the break. Nothing, nothing mandatory that's going to count towards attendance or anything just to keep us connected, have some fun over the semester break. If people are bored and stuff. So the officers will organize different events and we'll put the events in the Facebook group. If you're not on Facebook and still want to come, please send me, Cassie, an email. And I will make sure you're in the loop on whatever we decide. It might just be games, it might be a movie, pretty much anything. If you have any suggestions, 
let us know. We are very open to pretty much everything within reason. We play like over the summer, we played Cards Against Humanity. It was very entertaining because we made a whole a whole deck that's just FIT meteorology cards. So it was very entertaining to play. If the people who actually played can attest to that. So yeah, that's that. All right, National AMS Conference. Brian got the funding approved for those who filled out the form to go. So the forms that Brian sent to the group chat, please fill them out as soon as possible and give them back to Brian so you can get the refunds. I don't know how many people still to do it, but I just want to put the reminder. We may try to brainstorm an event or two if possible, as safe as possible to do during the week for the conference since this is virtual and there's a small amount of people going. So stay tuned. Everyone's in the AMS conference group chat, except Nico. Nico will talk to you when gotcha. anything happens with everything happening. So yeah, that's just about AMS conference, just a general reminder. So game day for study for on the study day. It is this Friday, December 4th, starting at 5. You're going to invite any of your friends from outside the club to come join. I just didn't make it public so we don't just get random humans coming that are not related to anybody in any sort of way. They're your friends. That's fine. We're going to have Among Us a weather pictionary, and we can add more games if there's enough response to them. There'd be at least one breakout room so, like, people in Weather Pictionary don't have to ask, be hearing red as sus while they're trying to play Weather Pictionary because that would be very weird. So, and then I wanted to throw up this poll just for curiosity. So fill out that the poll I just did just because we're trying to see a general number of what people want to play. So fill that out. It's just so we can gauge, because if there's only a couple people want to play something, we can just keep it at one, or if there's anything else anyone else wants to play. This, there's no time limit to this. It's just come and go as you please. If you can't come till 5.30, come to 5.30. I'm going to give it another 20 seconds for anyone else who hasn't answered. That number is not changing, so I'm just going to end it. Oh, well, this is funny. It all tied, basically, so. Okay, we're just gonna keep going with what we got since no one else had another suggestion. So let's be Weather Pictionary Among Us. You can bounce back and forth in between games. However, depending on worst case, somebody, whoever's in Among Us, can someone can just make the room, however, if I decide to go the other way, so. Cool, stop, share. Thank you for answering that. All right. And then finally, congrats to Karsh for winning the pottery brackets. That was on our Instagram story. I don't know. Applaud. There you go. Applaud. So Karsh is to the right. She painted the beautiful dolphin. And Brian was runner up. So he painted the beautiful pineapple. So Karsh is now going to be the Twitter cover photo for the, for the month. And Brian is going to be the... Um, Cloud Friday for, for this Friday. So congrats to them both. And that's everything that we that we made. It's a good event. We're hopefully going to try to do it yearly because this place was actually nice and they were full of nice people. So that's everything that was made in a pretty collage. So yeah. Now, we can, now for the thing that most of you probably came for versus hearing me ramble, you can listen to Kevin, Lindsay, and Amanda talk about grad schools and everything. So yeah, let me stop the share. Okay. Now you, all right. So you guys just want to introduce yourself first, however. Uh, Amanda, you want to go first? Let's pick Amanda. She's the first one I saw. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Amanda Sava. I graduated from Florida Tech in the spring of 2017. I went to Florida State for grad school. And I graduated there this past spring in 2020. Um, anything else you want me to say? Maybe we could just start with introductions and then kind of look okay. at the questions <laughs> I sent y'all. How about Kevin? Kevin's next. He's the next person I saw. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm Kevin Nelson. I um, let's see what year did I graduate? I guess I graduated in 2012. So a good long way back. Um, 
this and I, I was actually still there, I guess, when they were doing the um, summer research stuff, which I guess they're not doing anymore from what Cassie told me. So that's depressing to me. But um, I did, I went from Florida Tech to University of Kansas, did my master's there, graduated there in 2015. And now I am at uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi. So not the main campus. I'm one of the smaller campuses, uh, also right on the ocean. It's the university itself is actually on an island. Um, so it's kind of a, that's kind of one of its draw points, but I'm working on my PhD. I just submitted my first paper from my dissertation to the journal. So it, I'm probably about a year and a half from graduation. And it's, as a general rule, I would say it's pretty refreshing to see so many people and the group having grown so much from back when I was president. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Thank you, and now Lindsay's turn. Hey, I'm Lindsay, and I graduated a year after Amanda, so I left FIT uh, spring of 2018. I've been at University of Maryland ever since, um, finishing out my master's credits and moving into pre-candidacy research next semester. So I'm like anywhere between three to six years away from graduating, because who knows how long it's going to take. But <clears throat> yeah. Very true. Okay, so now let me go. The I did not organize the questions well. Okay, so I guess we'll just start since you all graduated in different years. We'll start at the beginning. What was the thought processes and how you picked where you went? Because a lot of, there's a we have quite a few members here trying to think of where they want to go to grad school, but they don't really know what to do and what to pick. So, how did you all pick where you went and why? Well, if it's okay with everyone, I'll start with that at least because in my case. And I think it's generally well received in the any physical science or any grad school, really. Um, the best thing to do, and I'm sure Dr. L or Split will tell you this, is that's, that's what they told me um, back when they were like the only two professors. Yeah, I'm that old. Um, they told me, find someone that you want to work with. So it has nothing to do with the university. Um, find someone that you want to work with, someone that researches something you're interested in, um, and also that has a funded position. Right now, um, that might be kind of scarce, but as a general rule, I haven't seen a huge decrease in the funding across you know, different areas, but I would say if you don't have some kind of guarantee of funding, it probably won't be worth it to you because you'll go even further in debt. Um, and then, you know, find something or find a professor that does something you're interested in, you know, whether it's hurricanes, severe weather, um, boundary layer stuff, remote sensing, you know, whatever your niche is, you can usually find something to do, even if it's not your advisor's primary focus. So for example, when I left Florida Tech, I wanted to do modeling. Um, so I wasn't super focused on any one thing, but my advisor got me into kind of boundary layer and microphysics and that kind of stuff. Um, and now where I am now, my, my advisor focuses on GPS radio occultation, remote sensing, but I get to study hurricanes with it. So you know, just usually if you're, if you're open enough, you can find someone that has, you know, at least an interest in doing something else, but it needs to be, you know, you have to be open and they have to be open to kind of changing things up a little bit, I think. Yeah, I definitely agree. Look for someone you want to work with more than like the name of the school itself. Um, you don't want to spend two or three years working with someone that you don't get along with because then, because I mean, it's going to get hard. So like, if you're not, <laughs> if you don't have a good relationship with your advisor, then it's just going to make it even worse. Um, Younger advisors will probably also understand a little bit more. Yes. 
end that yeah at umd there's a clear divide between the younger advisors and the like the dinosaur advisors and so a lot of people mm. tend to gravitate towards the the younger advisors because they get it yeah i mean that's what i ended up doing <laughs> and there's a general rule i think academia is changing like as people my age start graduating and becoming professors you know you'll see more and more of the like yeah you still have to do the really you know not fun stuff like your comprehensive exams and your candidacy exams and you know all the all the nonsense that you have to deal with um proposals and grant funding and whatever but you know people that aren't dinosaurs understand what it's like to have something like anxiety or you know understand that medical issues happen or you know that like even here one of my friends as an advisor in a different field that's just a slave driver. And I just, I feel so bad for her. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, you have to kind of know what you're getting into a little bit. And that's why I would also recommend talking to their current or former graduate students as well. Yeah, that's a really good idea to get in contact with current students. And a lot of times, a lot of graduate schools have their graduate students listed on their websites with email addresses that you can contact too. But that's the best way to get like what it's really like at the program. Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting and, how they also received like on um, different social media and dating apps. I've had people like searching, you know, what's Corpus Christi like? And I mean, obviously it kind of sucks, but <laughs> um, you know, it's not like, it's, a, the area is a lot like Florida Tech, but it's a lot more crazy. Um, but the, I think in general, you know, any way you can get any kind of information about the, the school or, you know, even just asking random people like I've had happen to me, um, going to, like, if you guys are going to AMS, which obviously do this safely, right, but, um, or AGU for that matter. Um, the universities always have big, you know, talking where they talk about their programs and they have you know, all this free stuff. Um, and I think it's, you know, that's a good opportunity to talk to grad students and you have at least one like admissions person or professor or, and they can usually recommend like, oh, you might like this person, you know, that kind of thing. I spoke to Amanda at AMS in, <laughs> yeah. in Boston. I spoke to Amanda. That's how I knew, met Amanda. Amanda. Yeah, I was there at the Florida State table. <laughs> but yeah, we had, it was both of us graduate student representatives. And then we also had our uh, program coordinator. And mm -hmm. she knows a lot more about the nitty gritty, like application dates and the fees and the test scores. And this is the exact details that go into applying and once you get in, this is what you need to do. This is what the courses look like. This is what you need to have to graduate. Which um, about the funding thing too, I wanted to just kind of jump off of what Kevin said. Um, so some schools, it, it does definitely depend on the program, but like some schools, you don't need to have a major professor when you get there, which is I think is a nice thing. Um, but a lot of schools, so like Florida State, most of the incoming graduate students still had a funded like teacher assistant position too. So that's another way to get funding. And then you get some teaching experience out of it too. But so don't be too discouraged or anything if the professor that you wanna work with says that they don't have funding right away. You can get it in other sources. In most cases, especially right now, um, since, you know, we're the, you know, internet generation and whatever, you know, right now they're going to be begging for people that know how to use, you know, Blackboard or what was it when I was there, Angel, whatever I used when I was at Florida Tech or whatever they call it now. But, you know, those the online platforms and that kind of stuff, they're going to be begging for people to help teach those courses. And I mean, for example, here you get stuck a lot of, a, a lot of TAs in their first year get stuck teaching like professional skills, which is a very like weird and broad range class that you just teach for the university it has nothing to do with the major, but it pays for your stipend for the semester. Like you still have to cover tuition, um, but 
you know, helps. any, any, any little bit helps, but the best case scenario if you want to do grad school would be to have a professor that has a funded, a grant funded or school funded position. Um, and they also can, the university will waive your tuition. So like Texas A&M university system, they don't give your tuition. So you're still on the hook for your tuition. But when I was at University of Kansas, because you're, if you're a TA or RA, you're working for the university. So they actually waive your tuition. Florida State's the same way. They'll waive it if you have a, because you're a school employee. Yeah. So Maryland, um, I don't know if, uh, your schools end up doing this, but there's like an application deadline. So you have to apply by this certain date if you want to get funding. And so anyone who applies before then will either become an RA or a TA. Um, so they're, they're funded either through the department or the, um, the advisor. So I ended up getting lucky, get a TA position for my first year. I was very unlucky with my second year because my advisor still didn't have enough funding. So he made me TA for a second year and then now I'm fully funded with a grant. But the process for me, I was looking for schools that would pay me to go and waive my tuition because I was already in a lot of debt to begin with because FIT is so expensive. Um, so I only got into two and one of them wasn't waiving my tuition. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to go where they're waiving my tuition. And it ended up being the, my top choice because I was in contact with a lot of uh, professors there. So if you're applying, I recommend you talk to professors and grad students, just like how Amanda and Kevin said, you definitely should be talking to grad students. I didn't, so I didn't really know what I was getting into, but um, I've noticed there's a lot more people now asking grad students than there were when I was applying for school. Well, and I think that to kind of bounce off that, like when I opened up with saying, you know, find someone that you're interested in working with, that also yeah. emailing them and saying, hey, will you have funding available to take on a student? You know, you need to be proactive um, and just say, you know, like, hey, I'm graduating at this time and, you know, this is my, this is my timeline. I'm interested in working with you because these are my interests. And, you know, would you maybe have funding for a graduate student? And they will probably set up an interview. It's, you can treat it like a, an actual job application, right? Because um, ultimately it, it is a full-time job. You get paid for like 20 hours of work a week, but you're spending 40 at the office kind of thing, so. PhD. Minimum 40. Well, I, yeah, that's that's my caveat, right? Is that for the masters, it's like, okay, you're kind of guided by the advisor a little bit more. And then for your PhD, like you're spending 60 a week working easily, so. It, it gets it gets rough, but it's ultimately worth it. Cassie, do you think we should move on to another question? Yeah, I was about to put on a question. So we talked about that. So let's talk about something just before before y'all graduated. Did you any of you? I think Lindsay might have, but did any of you do internships before graduation? And if so, what kind slash where did you gain such opportunities? Ooh. Um, I ended up getting really lucky. Uh, I don't know how it happened, but after my sophomore year, I ended up getting an internship at NASA Langley Research Center up in Hampton Roads. It's awesome if you guys ever get the opportunity to intern there. But the job I ended up doing was I was analyzing model output for, I don't remember what kind of model. Maybe it was Mara 2. I don't know. I hated it. It was awful. Um, I was working with IDL and I don't, I don't use IDL and my advisor and my mentor was very hands-off. He would meet with me like once a week. And then um, I couldn't wait for that to be over. But then I was in contact with other people in the building with like the kind of research that I was interested in. So I do air quality. Um, and so because I was in contact with them, they asked me to come back to work for them the following year. So instead of doing field projects, I replaced that with an internship. And then they asked me to come back again after I graduated. So I I don't wanna sit there and put that on, oh, I was smart enough, I got it. I, I thought I was just lucky that I got all of it. But because I got that internship, 
I got connected with people at University of Maryland because my branch had used to work there. He was a postdoc and an adjunct professor and everything kind of just fell in the right cracks, I guess. I don't think that's great advice, but that's, that's kind of what happened to me with uh, internships. Um, my, I interned at the Ocean Prediction Center at NSEP the summer before, before junior year, so in 2015. Um, and that was all, it was like, it was two months long and we got to stay on campus at like Howard University and then would go out to uh, Research Park, which there is like a UMD affiliated place there. I forget what, I think it's, what it's called. But. Essex. Yeah, 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 that one. Yeah. I was like, I know so it's some kind of they, acronym, but I can't remember. They used to have a joint partnership with the um, with my department, but our department chair just left us to go work somewhere else. So now there's no partnership anymore. I'm like, Whoa. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> um, but that, so that internship was through the NOAA Center for Atmospheric Sciences. So, and it was for, it was geared towards minorities. So like women and um, other minorities and under, like, you know, so the, I just go, I was Googling meteorology internships and I think I applied to like 20 and got the one luckily. So I knew that I was going to have field projects that next summer. So I wanted to do something after sophomore year and before junior year to have something else on my resume too. But there's a lot of internships out there. And even if it's not like a paid one, mine luckily was, but you can just ask to volunteer places to like reach out and say, I'm, you know, looking for, I don't know, a volunteer position, or I'd love to help out. I'd love to come observe maybe at like a local weather station, if that's what you'd like to do, or if there's a forecast office to just say, you know, just start out by saying like, I'd like a tour or something. And then you can always strike up a conversation about it that way too. So it doesn't yeah, necessarily have to be a traditional kind of internship, but something to get your foot in the door really helps. I, I, I agree. I, I ended up doing that with um, NWS Melbourne and they were kind and gracious to me and let me volunteer and they, they did tours with me a lot. Um, but for NASA, you can apply to 15 different NASA opportunities at once. And um, so I recommend going in there and applying for 15 random ones and then doing exactly what Amanda said, reaching out to people and then looking up meteorology internships. It's great, it's great advice. I think I applied to like 30 the summer after sophomore year and I only got one. So it's hard, but once you get your first internship, the next ones are super easy to get because you already have your foot in the door at that point. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Although I will preface everything I'm about to say with, I didn't technically do an internship while I was there. Um, I actually did my first internships as part of my PhD program. So it's something you can continue to do. Um, the, the first one I did, I was, I ended up at, um, it was the last year that they were doing it because the Trump administration was, that was one of the funding cuts on the chopping block that year or whatever. So it was the last year that they were doing it, but I did a two week programming boot camp that I already knew everything for um, <laughs> just because I was a PhD student not to say it's not helpful um, but I did the two-week programming boot camp at University of Virginia and then did um, the remaining two and a half months or so at Goddard at NASA Goddard so um, my biggest thing I would agree with what you know Amanda and Lindsay said um, but I would caution against taking in pay, unpaid internships if you have to move. It is not worth it if you're going to have to, you know, really move. Like, I went from Texas all the way up to Maryland. You know, I had, I was lucky because my university applied, can provide some funding for travel and that kind of thing, which I think Florida Tech probably would do too, um, to some extent. But, you know, it's easier to get that kind of funding if you're a graduate student. So, I mean, don't think that internships are only for undergrads. You know, I did NASA Goddard and NASA JPL just because, you know, they came up. One of them I applied for, the other was more of a, 
hey, my my advisor told me, you know, hey, I need to finish up the research for this grant, so I'm going to send you to JPL and do it this summer. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so, but if you have to move of a, if you have to go of long distance, you know, make sure you bring the cost of your travel, because if they're not, it's going to be super expensive, and you want. And if you are going to do it, even if you have to foot the bill for your own travel, make sure they're paying you because you're going to have to pay rent. <laughs> so, you know, I, when I was at Goddard, it was, the, it was the ACES internship, the Advanced Computing and Earth Sciences internship, I think. Um, you know, and they were, they were paying whatever, like, standard base rate, but, you know, it's, Definitely worth it because they, those internships can really get you in the door, and a lot, especially at places like UMD, because a lot of those professors have joint positions between the university and NASA. Yeah, UMD is like the mecca for atmospheric science. Other than like UC Boulder, it's ridiculous. We have NIST, EPA, all of the NOAA facilities out here, NASA. Um, Howard University too, I think works Howard, really yeah, Howard's yeah. great. Um, My, like but yeah, so um, you also can find internships on AMS website. I don't know exactly where they are when you have to like, you just have to like play around with the site and find them. Yeah. Um, and there was something else I was gonna say. Oh yeah, yeah, there's two more things. If you're a sophomore, you can apply for the NOAA Holling Scholarship, and you, if you get it, you also get the opportunity to intern with NASA, not NASA, NOAA. And then, um, if you guys are coming up on your senior year, just send an email to um, the Sioux over at NWS Melbourne. I don't know who the Sioux is, might be Dave Sharp still, but send an email to someone over at NWS Melbourne and see if you can volunteer because that's that's extra few hours of volunteering per week that you guys can put on your resume. Volunteering is good, especially since there's a, a station, you know, right there in town. I, I wish I had, you know, like had a car while I was at FIT so I could have actually done that on a regular basis. Yeah, a lot of that stuff's harder though now. Like, it's, well, like we can't really volunteer with National Weather Service now because of COVID. They're not letting any, really anyone in. Understood. That's the other thing is because COVID kind of just screwed everything up. Because yeah. I've already been ta and talking with them, but we, we couldn't even do our Skywarn class. There. They wouldn't let, they're like letting nobody in there right Is now. the Sue still Dave Sharp? I don't know. I just talked to Jesse about everything. I've been emailing um, Mr. Spratt over there. And he's, okay. he's been a good point of contact. That's great. Also with like internships and stuff too, like don't be hesitant to reach out to private companies too. There's a lot of, kind of like consulting companies that you could do or contracting companies. There's one that's right in um, Tallahassee that I had been talking to when I was there. And it's like he, it's him and his wife that run it and they do forecasts for, they do agricultural for, forecasts and other stuff as well. And he'll do like a tropical outlook, but you don't have to always look at the traditional avenues of NOAA, NASA. Um, you can be creative, I guess, <laughs> looking yeah. at different places. There's um, a couple of TV stations near FIT that um, that will also let students like volunteer or like do internships. And I'm sure Anna can talk about this, but um, my old roomie used to do an internship at some TV place. I don't know what's called in Orlando for two years. And he worked there thinking he was going to go into broadcast meteorology. So if you are interested in media, that's also another outlet you can choose. Just make sure you're reaching out to someone. Okay, so since we talked about internships, all right, well, um, okay, so we'll keep we'll keep on the FIT train for a little bit more. Um, well, we know summer field. The other question is about summer field programs. We know they they you guys had your summer field program, but they cut it for meteorology. For those of you who why do not did know, they do that? That's ridiculous. A couple of people who asked. Me. They make us do now, so they cut it, because I, I had a fresh, it was a freshman or sophomore asked that question. They cut the field research because, according to Dr. L, because 
is not much stuff in the field now. So we make you take this data analysis class. So you learn how to use a program that just never is used I was so anymore. mad when he did that because that was the last year to do summer field projects. And I'm like, you mean to tell me I spent $7,000 to take an internship somewhere else when everyone else after me just doesn't have to do anything except for take that class. I was so mad about that. Yeah, it used grads, which isn't really even used overly as much. I know it's mostly Python and uh, R. And I do know that people that use grads. So grads is useful. Uh, yeah. For so people it is still who do climate well, research, it's pretty useful. Yeah. And it's good for yeah, school projects okay, well, too, cool. like later when you have to do just a class project because it's not that hard and you can just do it. Like a lot of schools still have it on the computers. So yeah. sometimes it can be a little simpler. <laughs> but oh, yeah. I am very upset to hear that they got rid of field projects. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> it, was a, it was a lot of money, really but. <laughs> yeah, because didn't you guys have to go down to Key West like and fun. embark there and just go on a cruise for several yeah, weeks? Yeah, pretty much. We did like nothing except scuba dive for like three days <laughs> oh my god that sounds so cool <laughs> we were we were Man, helping cool. like the biological oceanography students do some kind of like seagrass stuff but we we took re weather observations and they actually got it in um well the boat had to get certified and i don't think it was but like we actually did weather stuff too ours was a lot different we i mean i don't know it must have changed somewhat significantly but what I what we ended up doing was we had the um three days a week each with a different professor so mine was with um Dr. L and then Mr. Split and I chose Dr. Mall when he was still around as my um third option because I wasn't into you know the air water quality and I wasn't into the biology so I did the physical is he still doing beach profiling? Dr. Mall passed away, so. I know, I meant when you did field projects. I, yes, he was doing the beach profiling. So I would stand, like, one of my kind of weather pictures of me doing stuff in the field is me standing there on the beach with the stadium rod thing and just being like, I'm the only one that can hold this in the water, you know, because you have to go, like, into the water. So I was the only one tall enough to actually, like, keep my balance. But, um... And then we did like the cruise was for like five days. I personally hated the cruise because I get super seasick. <laughs> it took me like a whole 36 hours to acclimate and I was just useless that whole time. Yeah, when um, we did the cruise for, what is it? The, the meteorology class you take song. Oh, uh, yeah. 2407? Yes, yes. Um, I the seas were so choppy that day. And I remember sitting inside or standing up inside the boat just holding onto rails just to keep myself stable because it was just like this the whole time. I and fell on the miserable. boat and our TA had to like catch us. I fell right on my knee on the boat because hit a wave. Still remember that. They don't do them anymore because Dr. Mall isn't teaching. So the new professor doesn't do them because he doesn't even know what the heck it barely is. So it's sad because that was literally the best memory I've had. I mean, the program was that cruise. It was so I much fun. Yeah, I, I thought it was so much fun even though I was like throwing up for like the entire time and like below deck just like asleep in one of the beds but it was it was fun in the beginning <laughs> with all the clouds experience but i like i for that particular class i actually took the, the equivalent um because i i graduated in three years so i did a lot of summer classes my first summer there at um at the time it was brevard community college now it's like eastern florida state college mm. or something like that um, and at the time they had like an equivalency agreement. And so I did, you know, like one of my civilization courses and linear algebra, differential equations and meteorology, that intro to meteorology course, um, that was all done that summer. So that helped me kind of push through in three years, but so I never had to do that first cruise. So the, the research cruise was kind of a rude awakening for me. <laughs> I found out I would get, I get pretty seasick. Um, I didn't get sick because I heard ahead of time, you know, take some antiemetics, <laughs> but, you know, they, the previous class, like, went out into the Gulf Stream and got, you know, far enough out that they actually got pretty big waves and they, the whole crew got super sick. So I was like, I'm not taking any risks. I'm not using just team here. But... I think the, the summer field programs also kind of ties in with the internship question, too, because... 
you know, it gives you an opportunity to go somewhere else and do something different, which I think is refreshing for a lot of students, but can also be kind of a wake up call that, you know, maybe they don't want to do broadcast meteorology or they don't want to do weather forecast office. Like I would never, ever want to do weather service just because I just, I can't, I can't do it. I just, I can't, I can't. So, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of what you might be interested in too, as far as research topics. If you are looking for grad schools, it'll give you contacts for grad schools. And, you know, like, you know, Lindsay said, the NASA applications, you can, you basically do one application, I think, and it, you apply for like 15 different internships at one time. Yes, it's great. You have this main application and then you can send in like a single paragraph to each application explaining why you want that specific internship. It's so easy. I love it. Yeah. So, and I, so I would definitely recommend trying to do something like that. But I mean, when I was there, like, right, like I said, I didn't do any kind of internship. I actually just worked for Dr. L on work study. Um, so, I mean, you can volunteer just within, well, I don't know what his group situation looks like now, but <laughs> um, when I was there, you know, there were a couple of grad students and we were still in the link building for the first two years. And then the last year we were in the engineering building. So they had, you know, moved people around a whole lot. And, um, but I was, I did stuff like working on the data that he was recording from something and saving it to data tapes. I was working, the, uh, my official title was data archivist. So it helps you learn Linux a lot. That's very helpful. That's one thing I would definitely recommend doing if you don't have anything going on like over a summer or something is learn Linux, learn like Python. <laughs> because when you get to grad school, it's gonna be a lot of programming and really and you get, Cassie, maybe you can, since you're really the only person I know there, um, maybe you can speak to it, but the, uh, the programming classes that I took, I took the Fortran and C++ courses that were required. They did not help me at all. Oh, I hate C++. No, I learned everything from Dr. L because I'm doing research with Dr. L and he's been kind of showing me how to do Python because I'm like, I don't know what any of this means. I have bad professors. They're not yeah. good, anything. They're helpful and honestly well okay they were helpful i just didn't understand it at the time because like when you get to dynamics dr l when i was there he was teaching it and he actually had a project you know that you actually have to use a combination of matlab and fortran to do this analysis or whatever um for one of his weird group homeworks that we had to do and so like it started clicking then but at the time I was like, okay, I can do print hello world. Like I can do simple stuff, but I had no I idea. I love that. It's like the default in C++ on, on this Visual Studio. Hello world. Never forget that. It's, simple. It's, the e it's the easiest program. And, but the big thing right now I would say is, you know, if you can try to learn Python or IDL or something, you know, MATLAB, I would recommend against R because not many people in our field use it. Um, personally, I think it's terrible in the first place. Um, Python can do all the same stuff and it makes more sense and it's Fortran under the hood. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but I would rec definitely recommend doing that. If, if, you know, you aren't doing some kind of work with somebody, you know, and like Cassie said, doing a, a research project for either a directed independent study course or just, hey, I want to help you know, do your research and stuff like that kind of experience is very helpful because then when you get to grad school, you're not like, what's coding? Because it, it really is more or less all that we do. Like Dr. L does have a point that it's really like taking observations is helpful in understanding how the data works, but it's really not what's practical, I think right now. So I don't, well, I don't, agree with his decision to cut everything from field projects over the summer I understand the reasoning and I can see where it would be beneficial to replace it with a coding class though I would choose to maybe do Python instead of this Brad's thing I've never heard of yeah I've never heard of it either I'd rather learn Python but you know if I can take that next semester so 
Yeah, and if I mean if they're teaching a Python class, that's great. If anyone just wants um, a lecture or a series of lectures for Python, like how to use Python, I have I took a class here because I was required to, um, and I have all the lecture slides from from him. And he's the guy. His name is Chantal Liu. And he made the precipitation feature database that a lot of people that use Trim and GPM use. Like he's he's one of those people that is. You know, revolutionized how people use trim and, and GPM data. So he knows, he knows his stuff. That works. Well, that kind of leads into another question. Since we talked about the field research and internships and we were trying to talk about research, um, what kind of research did, you, if any of you, did you guys do any research while you're an undergrad, like working on a project with a professor outside of like classes? Just field projects. Just field projects. Okay. I didn't do anything on campus. All of my research was off campus. Um, so I'm not, I mean, do you guys want me to like say what I did or, cause I didn't do anything on campus. So I can't really speak on that. I mean, however you want. I'm just going in order on the questions. Kelly's asking, yes, was it NWS? Okay. Um, well, at NWS, the person who was in charge of me, he's a great guy, but very like hands off. So he didn't really work. So I just shadowed all the forecasters uh, and then maybe worked on graphics. That's pretty much all I did. Uh, but it was fun. They're all fun over there. But at NASA, I, my second year there, when they asked me to come back, I was the lead weather and air quality forecaster for the outlets field mission. So um, that was really cool. I got to go out in the field. So I did do like a field campaign, but it wasn't through the university. Um, so in the morning I would do, I would submit my forecast, give, uh, give my forecast to everyone via teleconference. And then um, in the afternoon I would go out in the field and start taking measurements, which sucked because it was always on like 95 plus degree days when we knew ozone was going to be really high that day but um so it was really fun and then my second year working on the alice campaign my third year interning um i actually went back as a contractor and so i was working on air trajectory modeling to see how um how all the forecast corresponded with what the model was saying so uh, that's kind of that was kind of my gateway into modeling, and that's kind of how I got into um, regulatory air quality models at UMD. Okay, I have a question from someone who actually who couldn't come, but he's gonna watch the recording. Shout out to Zach when he watched the recording. But he said, "I am only a sophomore, but I know that I, I want to go to grad school. I know it's early, but I have no idea what type of research I want to get into. When did you know what you wanted to focus your research on?" Not until the summer, right before grad school. So it took me a very long time to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. And some people also wait until their second semester of grad school and it's totally fine. So depending on what school you go to, just like how Amanda said, like some people don't go in having an advisor, they TA for the first year, that happens a lot at UMD. And so the grad students in my program aren't expected to figure out who they wanna work with and what their project is and what they wanna do, et cetera, et cetera, until like April of their first year. So like you still have time. Don't don't get stressed about it right now because you still have a lot of time. That being said though, I would recommend as a general rule, you know, taking note of what you maybe not do best with, but what interests you most and kind of mm -hmm. find them in your classes. Like once you get to dynamics, I think you'll really start to see mm -hmm. um, where everything kind of comes together from what Cassie's yeah. told the, the math is not as present because of the current professor, which is really sucky um, because the math is really what's important in the dynamics. Um, but between that and like dynamics and optics and maybe, um, I don't know if they still teach, who teaches the atmospheric physics course. Palatine. Um, that class is great. Dr. Palatai still does the atmospheric physics and Dr. Ray teaches dynamics one and Dr. L teaches dynamics two. Synoptic is one I was telling you about. Dynamics oh, okay. is still fine, but it was synoptic, but, but still. Dynamics is good. That's, that's di Dr. L's notes for dynamics, perfect. They're <laughs> the 
the best material that I have ever seen for a dynamics course. Uh, I don't even take classes anymore, and I still look at his dynamics notes. That's how useful they are. I have two full binders of all those PDFs that he print that he printed out for us or sent us at one at whatever point. Like they're all saved on my hard drive. I it's, I used his material to study for my comps rather than the material I actually have in for grad school because his was way more useful than any dynamics class I've taken in grad school. It. Well, and I mean, if you were at UMD, one of my, one of the guys that we have here just graduated, the guy that teaches dynamics there probably is hard to understand from whatever, from whatever. Dunlin, he's a great guy, but his accent is very thick (laughs) and he speaks very fast. And so like, it takes you about a month to kind of like get used to it just to be able to take notes, but great guy, nice professor, just very different. Language barriers, people speaking quickly, not understanding the math. You know, there's a lot that can go on in a synoptics or a dynamics class for that matter. But mm-hmm. dynamics is really when it starts to click. And that's also when you're doing your applications. It's kind of during dynamics one is when you want to do your grad school applications. Yeah. So ideally you will have already taken the GRE, although not all schools are requiring the GRE. Most schools that I'm aware of that do meteorology still will. Um, a lot of schools are waiving that, though. I've looked at a couple. So yeah, for far. COVID, they're waiving. A, mo- yeah. a lot of schools are. And then some schools are permanently waiving it because they think it's kind of. I mean, ultimately. UMD's yeah. doing like a three year thing where they're waiving it for three years and seeing how it goes. Um, they might not require it in three years, but. Which I is great. Yeah. You know, obviously, I started graduate school a lot, a lot longer ago than you guys did. So it's different for me, but. Um, you know, think about taking the GRE like the summer before your senior year. You know, if you know what schools you're going to apply to already and they say, okay, well, COVID, we won't be taking it or, you know, just they've waived it entirely, whatever, that's great. But if you're going to do it, the summer before is the time to prep for it. Um, Mm -hmm. Although during, if, I guess since you guys won't be doing field projects anymore, that makes it a good time. (laughs) Um, But anyway, what I was, back to what I was saying, the when you get through dynamics and whatnot, you start to really, the math kind of brings everything together for you. Um, Because I remember being in synoptics with split and I would get it, but I wouldn't really kind of understand the greater implication of what I was learning. It was kind of just learn it to pass the test. And then once I got to dynamics, it all started clicking because they really started, you know, deriving the equations and showing us how all this works. And Mm -hmm. and a lot, I won't lie, but if, (laughs) it's good to see like it's yeah helpful. so florida state for undergrad and i kind of wish florida tech did it too they do synoptic one and dynamics one at in the same semester and then dynamics two and synoptic two in that that spring so like yeah it's a lot of work like it i feel so bad for the seniors there because it's a lot but because it goes so hand in hand with each other like it may i think it I think it makes it easier to understand. Yeah, I've seen a couple other schools do that too. And one of the other things that I would really suggest, and I know for a, at least, again, my when I was applying, it was like seven years ago. <laughs> so keep that in mind. I'm ancient compared to the rest of you. But um, one of the big things is make sure you take not only differential equations, but partial mm-hmm. differential equations. Yes. Yes. I wish I took PDE. I wish I <laughs> yeah, they took that out of, of the, yeah, they took that out a couple years ago or something. Well, it was never I a- was registered to take it the very first day. I sat down 20 minutes into the class, like, I don't know who the professor was, but he all, he didn't say anything. He just started writing something on the board. I think he was deriving like the Oshi oil or whatever it was. He didn't say anything for the first 20 minutes. And someone said, excuse me, I have a question. And he turned around like this. You don't have a question. <laughs> I do. And I was like, no, no. And I packed up everything and I left and I immediately dropped the class after that. And I wish I didn't do that, but it's a good story to tell now. Uh, yeah. That does. Uh, that was at Florida tech. Yeah. I don't remember who it was. I don't remember what semester it was. Um, was it, it was supposed to be Pereira and then the professors got switched right before semester started. Oh God, I can't remember his name. Pereira for my, for my dynamics or my, my PDEs course, but I think I had, I had for calculus three, 
I had Kigaradzi. And that sounds like- That was the guy. I couldn't yeah. remember his name, but that's it. Great for Calc 3. Like he's a great, great professor, but I will be, it's like, and one of my roommates was a math double major. So I was like, you know, talking to her about it the whole time. But um, I liked Pereira for PDE, but I, the reason I say this is because certain schools will require it. Like mm -hmm. University of Oklahoma requires PDEs for all graduate students, to my knowledge, um, at least at the time when I was applying. And if you don't have it, they make you take it and it doesn't count toward your master's credits. So you have to pay for a course that you don't get to count toward your degree because it's required for what you're doing. So if you want to go to grad school, I would highly recommend taking PDEs, not only for its value, but also because it will make you more marketable and then you won't have to go through some kind of, I've heard they, some schools refer to it as kind of like math reprogramming in some way, because like they don't know what math you've learned and so they have to kind of teach you from scratch. And so it's kind of, I would think it's a good idea to take just in general, but. Mm -hmm. You know, I still I still have the book that I used from PDEs and I still reference it from time to time. But the reason you take it is because all of those equations that you see in dynamics and synoptics are all PDEs. They're much more complicated than you'll ever deal with in um, in the actual PDEs course. The dynamics stuff is way more complicated. But the same idea when it comes to solving them, you know, assume a wave solution and all that stuff, that's all going to be on your comps, that's going to be on your qualifying exams and all that, whatever they're called, that's everywhere. So they, it's definitely worth taking. If you end up doing some sort of modeling or data simulation at some point, you're going to have to use PDEs. I use PDEs with my, with what I do. It's not fun, but it's taken time for me to learn how to do it just because I never took PDEs. Yeah, um, what was her name? Um, when I was there, I think, I believe she also passed away, Dr. Coxell in the math department. Yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah, she, she taught a kind of modeling and applied math course. We had to use Mathematica, which is one, just one of those weird programming languages, but you can do the same stuff with Python or IDL or whatever you want to use. I would also recommend taking a course like that. If they haven't come up with some kind of like intro to modeling and numerical methods for meteorology course that they're teaching, take some kind of numerical methods or modeling class in the math department. Because mm -hmm. I think no matter what you decide to go into, whether you know you do air quality, whether you do you know, remote sensing, all of it's you know, gonna depend on not only modeling, but it'll help you understand what interpolation to use It'll under, help you understand the kind of mathematical methods you should be using. All that kind of stuff is very important. If they teach a numerical analysis class, what's weird is no one is registered for it in the spring, so you'll be all alone if you take it. But they also have a doctorate, um, usually it either alternates. He does numerical weather prediction. That usually alternates, but otherwise, yeah, numerical I analysis. Yeah, I took his numerical weather prediction class, and we just, we just I, Dr. Ray was my advisor, very smart man, but we just really read a lot of papers and like yeah. presented on those in class. <laughs> so it wasn't so much like the coding portion. Yeah, like we did talk about that too and he showed us some derivations, but it wasn't a full on in-depth yeah. like modeling class. Yeah, you learn the bare minimum <laughs> with NWP. I mean, I I still use like, this much of what he he taught uh he teaches straight out of a book that someone in my department wrote which is really cool but um right so it's like it's 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 good material but it's you don't really learn how to apply any of it so another um, instance where you could potentially learn coding it's you know those kinds of classes like I, I told you i graduated in three years my last semester could have been basically just dynamics and like Anky ass remote sensing class that I had, because um, I I had Dr. Bud and it was his like first time teaching the course. I don't know I don't know if you guys ever met Dr. Bud. I think he's still around somewhere. 
I've never heard of him. He was a super old guy when I had him, so I don't know. Maybe he already gone and died, but <laughs> he was he was one of the guys that worked on like the Landsat satellites when they were top secret. So like cool. he knew his shit, right? <laughs> but um, he just wasn't a good teacher, right? So all this, all the remote sensing stuff, I uh, I ultimately learned down the line, and so. But, you know, my senior year could have been easy, but I took PDEs, I took modeling and applied math, I took the dynamics two, which was required, and like one other or two other classes. I took a, maybe climo, because that's usually, because I like my senior year, I only have to take climo and dynamics, and I'm trying to figure out some other stuff to add to it. So it might be climatology. Take global climate change. That's a good class. I already plan on, so I'm taking climo early, so I'll be prepared for it. I want to take class. it. I you just read a lot of papers in class discussion. too. <laughs> I took a business class last semester. It was really interesting. You know, honestly, very easy too. Yeah, yeah that that's that's a good point. Actually, you can branch out and take other classes. I took political science, and I ended up taking two extra history classes just because I'm really interested in history. So, whereas I was like, your senior year fun. <laughs> I want the I want the math. Like I need to. That's know what me. I hate history. I haven't taken any of my humanities yet. And I have three semesters. I take one each semester because I've been procrastinating. I hate history. Oh. Take <laughs> Ruin. He's Dr. great. Doctor Perdigo. Any class with Ruin. Take her class. I'm taking British American Love with Crofton next semester. So heard she's easy. Oh, that's she's good. fantastic. That's really I cool. love her. It'd be like zombies and Tupac and Shakespeare. <laughs> But she was like the best Civ slash English esque teacher that I ever had, hands down. So if you get a chance to, if she's still there, if you take a chance with Doctor, take a class with Doctor Pertigau, she was. Oh, she's great. I, yeah, she's really good. They're like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the other thing is you can get advice on what to do from us. <laughs> Just be yeah, that's 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 true. Yeah, let's see what else we have okay so that was all that was that um this won't probably be cool are there any scholarships you recommend applying for is there any Hollings. like oh yeah, Hollings, yeah. Said the Hollings scholarship i got before. denied for Hollings. so there's also a scholarship through the dod i think it's called stars or something like that yeah, I, that, I, I'm gonna yeah go dig around. that one is it called smart smart yeah okay yeah yeah, it's it's really good. If you end up getting it, it's it's very competitive. But if you end up getting it, um, they pay your tuition, and then I think they give you a stipend. It's like it's like at least twenty eight thousand dollars a year for the stipend. It's ridiculous. Just as long as however many years you have the scholarship, you work for them as a contractor. And so, one of my friends who did ocean engineering, she got the scholarship her sophomore, her junior and senior year, and then worked for the DOD for two years. And it's great. She paid off her loans like that. For what it's worth, my University of Kansas advisor had a grant with the Naval Research Lab. And the DOD, um, so obviously I was doing work for the Navy, ultimately with my master's. But the DOD is very interested in um, understanding boundary layer meteorology because they need to know how to program their lasers for shooting down nukes. So um, <laughs> that was why I was doing my research ultimately, uh, when you think about it. Um, so there's, you know, any variety of things that you can find, you know, take it. But it, the DOD one, the smart one, I was a little wary of myself because I didn't I didn't want to work for the DOD afterward. Um, for grad school, I mean, I found that um, the scholarships tend to be more of an undergrad level thing. As a general rule, that's not always the case. Um, I get like a lot of the, the scholarships that I get at Texas A&M Corpus are school university or like university scholarships. So they're not a lot of money. It's like $1,000 toward tuition or something. And that saves money on later. So it's not like a huge amount, but usually universities will have some kind of semi-competitive scholarship that you can apply for. But on the whole, kind of falls into go into a funded program 
and you won't really need a scholarship. You know, kind of a caveat there that, I mean, you can always use the extra money and you can take out loans if you have to, but, you know, as, on, uh, as a general rule, you won't really need scholarships for graduate school because you'll m hopefully be either TA or RA funded. Hey, Lindsay, looks like she sent the she sent the two links she was referring to in the chat. Put in four different links. Hopefully, it so helps. four different links. I don't know how many. They kind of like they do kind of like blend like, together. Uh, that's what I was like. I don't know if it's two or four. Or what? But they're in there. So if you want I mean, to if look, you're okay. if you guys are looking for scholarships prior to grad school, those are great. Um, there's other fellowship opportunities you can look at through um, the intern.nasa.gov site. There's yeah. also the yeah. NSF. GRFP, mm. if you guys yeah, are seniors, you know what to do, and then all you have those, to do is go, yeah. Those are really different, right? They're not technically scholarships, they're fellowships. Yeah. Um, that's why I didn't talk about them. I was not actually eligible for the, the NSF one, so because, and that's because I already had my master's. The NSF is only, you can only get if you don't have a master's when you apply for it. So you either have to apply as a master's student or as a PhD student that came straight from a bachelor's? I but think you can apply as an undergrad. I'm pretty sure. I know you can as a senior. I think you can apply. As I know NSF is funded by all the REUs. I know REUs are kind of funded by NSF, yeah. so it's kind of indirectly them. I keep being denied for those two. So I'm just it's, it's so hard. <laughs> it I, wrote it's really good I mean, I, I would like to think was good but i passed it around to so many people to like check it over spell check because there were a lot of people's names on my proposal and then one of the reviewers was like reviewer number two was like this is terrible i'm like thanks yeah it's always reviewer two no matter what i was reviewer two the other day i had to reject a paper that cited my own paper and i was like i'm sorry i did a citation off this but your paper's crap so <laughs> <laughs> like ouch yeah it's it makes sense, but out I mean, still. It's just one of those things that happens. I mean, you, there's always going to be harsh reviews for fellowships and for grant applications and for you know, journal publications. It always happens, and it always seems to be reviewer two. And that's just something in academia that people accept. It's just they get reviewer two. And every once in a while, they become reviewer two. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Let's see. Well, um, let's see this one. Do you feel immediate attendance of grad school is the best option, or do you think some students could work and they go back to grad school? I know uh, quite a few people that work too before going to grad school, but if you know that's what you want to do, I would say do it sooner rather than later. But like one of my friends from Florida State, he worked for five years as a civil engineer and then is now at Florida State. So I mean, it's not the end of the world if you don't go right away, but I would say if you know for sure that's what you want to do. One of my best friends here, she graduated from University of Oregon with a degree in environmental science, and now she's, her advisor is the slave driver one that I was talking about now. Um, she, and she does like hydrogeology, so it's a completely different field, but she just couldn't get a job, and so she moved back home and was working as a manager at Petco for like eight years before finally deciding she wanted to go back to graduate school and now she's just graduated and you know she has her dissertation all together and sent to the university and all the good stuff she's looking for postdocs I mean so she's like 35 but there's never a bad time to go to graduate school one of the one of the even one of the bachelor's students that we have she's like 55 we have a retired military sergeant I think that's doing his bachelor's. I mean, it doesn't, it, these days it really doesn't matter. But I would say if you know you want to go to grad school, don't take a year off because you, all that stuff you learned in dynamics just gone. <laughs> yeah, there was, um, I worked with one person who took a year off just to pay off for student loans. She wasn't sure if she was gonna end up getting a position in grad school to pay her to go to school. So she worked for a year and then got so chemistry is her undergrad, worked for a year and then went straight into an atmospheric science program. Um, forgot all the chemistry. She took 
I don't know if she took a dynamics class, but she forgot everything and she was really struggling her first year. So if you know you want to go and you have the opportunity to go, I would just do it. Mm -hmm. But taking a gap year or taking five gap years, whatever, it, I guess it really just depends on your situation. I knew if I took a gap year, I would never go back to school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was so, the same way. I was like, once I'm done, then I'm not going to want yeah. to. Once you're out, you just want to stay out and work. It, it really just depends on what your situation is and what you know you want. And you can your... always go back. Yeah, like, like, they, like they both said, you mean, like, I went straight into grad school and I, from what I can tell, they did too, but mm. I mean, life happens. Sometimes you can't get in and COVID happens, you know, who the hell knows what's going to happen <laughs> with COVID and trying to get into grad school this, you know this year around and it's just it's going to be nuts so you know working for a year isn't necessarily bad just make sure you keep up on the material you know don't study. don't purposely go off and forget it yeah my advisor he went he tried going straight into a master's program right after his undergrad and his mom got really sick and so he was failing all of his classes and he just dropped out and then he took a year and a half off to, to work where his mom is, take care of his mom, and then moved across the country, went to grad school and excelled. So it really just depends on what your situation is. And yeah. if you take a full year of grad school, realize it's not your time, you leave, go work, and then you go back to grad school, that's also fine. Yeah. And you can work any job too. Like it doesn't, ha if, if you aren't gonna get a meteorology job right out of college, you know, life happens, you can, if you can get a meteorology job, great. And if you find out that's not what you want to do in meteorology, even better because then you've narrowed down your career path. It's just part of life. And I, yeah, my advisor went from being a physicist to his year and a half gap year digging graves. So it doesn't have to be in your field. It's kind of funny thinking that he used to be a grave digger. I don't know how that's funny. I, I just think it's so funny because he's he's not a blue collar kind of guy. Like sitting in his office all day, every single day, he just hates getting his hands dirty. And then I'm like thinking like, Tim, you used to be a grave digger, that's weird. <laughs> he gets a laugh about it now. I guess, yeah. But I don't, know. Probably... I just don't time off if you have to. You know, even and even if you're in the middle of grad school and you need to take time off, so universities have um policies and procedures for, you know, emergency leave for a semester or something. You know, one of my friends here uh, that I actually met, she was a master's student at Florida Tech. And then she came here to do another master's into a PhD um, because the Florida Tech master's didn't have a thesis and whatever. But while she was here, her dad died of lung cancer, which, you know, really sad. And she had to, you know, deal with all that. And she tried to keep going, but ultimately it just wasn't right for her. And so she took a leave and then decided it wasn't going to be something she wanted to continue with and she moved up to St. Louis and is currently working her marine biology job at the aquarium there and she loves it you know but universities have plans policies procedures all that stuff for mm -hmm. if something happens and you know like if you have to withdraw from your classes because your one of your parents dies you know or you know something like that they won't fault you for it you get like one or two semesters of emergency leave at most universities as a student, I think. So worth worth considering, you know, it's it's you know a lot of ways it's like any any regular job. You know, you get, mm -hmm. you get benefits in most places, you get paid in hopefully every place. <laughs> um, you know, life does happen and they have ways to counteract it for you so one of the last questions some I'm, I'm trying to read them i know some you answer so i'm trying to figure out what's been answered what hasn't this one this one could apply to even undergrads how do you stay motivated with everything you have to do or working those like 40 60 hour a week like in grad school how do you keep motivated You just have to, this is going to sound really kind of corny, but like you have to really know why you're there and why you want to do what you do. And then when it does get hard, just say like, 
you just got to keep that in mind. Having a good group of friends too. And luckily with most grad programs and like Florida Tech has a really small program too, but like a lot of grad programs are very small, just like Florida Tech's. So you get to know those people really, really well. And that's Especially awesome. Because you're taking classes with them. It's, it's a lot mm -hmm. like a lot like Florida Tech. At the bigger universities, I mean, you know, UMD is a good example. University of Oklahoma is a good example. Miami is a good example. But, you know, you kind of become friends with your cohort because- Yeah, that's class. more what I meant. <laughs> you know, and that's, you know, that's not a bad thing. It's, it, you have a good support system and you're all in the same classes, but it's also good to make friends that, you know, are further along in their degree and be like, oh yeah, you don't want to take it with this professor, you take it with this professor. And then, you know, you know, do this instead of this and make sure you do this on time because otherwise they'll punish you for this, you know, and all sorts of other stuff. People that have been through the, uh, been through the running before that know what they're doing. And I would also encourage people kind of as a side note to not totally discount the small schools. Obviously having been at Florida Tech, you guys should probably understand that, but um, the same goes for graduate school. Like at my university, you know, it's a &M, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, right? When people hear Texas A&M or Texas and meteorology, they think either Texas Tech or A&M College Station, which is the main campus. But, you know, we have our program here. When I started, there were three people that taught meteorology and oceanography in like in our program. And we've added more people now and it's, you know, it's good, but you know, they do some of the smartest people I know are here despite it being, you know, just this tiny little university on an island. So keep that in mind. I don't know if mine is exactly the healthiest um, way of going about it, <laughs> but bouncing off the cohort thing, it's kind of like that. There's a girl that I TA'd with, the girl that did chemistry, took a gap year and then started off. We TA together, took all of our classes together. We're in the same research group and, um, she, she wants to go get her PhD. I want to get my PhD. Um, the guy that I worked for at NASA was like, I'm only going to hire you if you get your PhD. So that, that was my end goal. But I was like, okay, if she is going through the program, we both promised each other we're going to go through the program. So I can't disappoint her. I got to keep going through the program. Um, so her kind of sticking through with it is making me like, yes, I have to stick through with it. And then also my advisor said to me the other day, don't disappoint me. I'm like, I can't disappoint him. So that's just my motivation. Like I can't disappoint people. I got to do this for them and I got to do this for me. So I don't, that's not exactly the healthiest way about going about it, but I would agree that's the way that I do it. <laughs> I would agree that that's not the super healthy way to do it, but I think- So I don't recommend doing that. But I do think there is something to be said for, you know, like kind of the we're in this together kind of approach, like with the cohort that you, you know, join with. I yeah, because our original cohort, it was like, there were three or four people in it, and now it's just me and her. So her and I are like, we got to stick to it. We got to get through this program. We got to hype each other up before we present at our group meetings. You know, it's just kind of the way that her and I end up going through this. Yeah. Re and realistically, as long as it, as long as motivation doesn't involve a lot of alcohol, it's probably okay. Because <laughs> I mean, I've got a big wine rack here. That helps me cope. Well, Don't don't do as I, don't do what I do. <laughs> well, most of you, when you come of age, it'll probably involve a lot of alcohol because even the researchers are like, let's go get a beer. You know, it's kind of like the equivalent of like the work gets done on the golf course. Well, academics go and drink beer. Yeah. You know, it's, Lots of trivia nights when they have time. Yeah. But I think in general, motivation is something that's individual. I don't think it's one thing works for everybody, especially right now. Like I'm, I'm approaching my limit at working from home, but the one time I went to campus with my office mate the last seven months, he got it, he exposed me to COVID. So I'm like, I'm not going back. <laughs> like he came down with COVID a couple days after I saw him. And so I had just recently got out of that isolation. So I'm just, you know, you do what you can. And sometimes for me, it's learning to, make sure I take the time to, you know, especially right now, you know, make sure I sleep. Um, for some people, you know, it's going to the gym. I want to be that person, 
but you know, I've gained the quarantine 20 or whatever it is. So like, just I'll fix that when I get out of <laughs> when COVID's over. <laughs> but, um, you know, motivation, you know, can be anything you know, like for me, you kind of, I think there is something to be said as corny as it sounds, there is something to be said for kind of setting realistic goals for yourself with respect to your degree progress, right? The first couple of years, think of it, you know, just on a semester scale, right? I have to get through these classes. I have to get through the next semester's classes, you know, just kind of each semester that resets until you're done with classes. And then after that, it's okay, I have to get my proposal done. Okay, now it's done. Now I have to do all the stuff and I have to kind of get this step and this step and this step done. And then I have to write my paper, you know, write my thesis. And for the PhD, it's okay, I finished all my classes. I did my proposal, get paper one done, get paper two done, get paper three done, defend and you're out. You know, it's kind of your, that's what's working for me right now. Because like I said, I just submitted my first paper to the journal and it's going to start going through peer review. And I'm not looking forward to it because I know I'm going to get reviewer two. I just know it. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's the first part of my dissertation. So I am now officially a third of the way done with my dissertation. Right? You just kind of, however you make your little milestones, whatever you want to do. It can be, I made it to the next day. Yay. <laughs> or it can be, you know, I made it through the next year. But no matter what you guys do, you can say, I went to college during a pandemic. I don't want to hear it from any of you. <laughs> When you guys become professors and whatnot, you know, you can say, I went, you can be that grumpy old person in the corner that says, I went to school during a pandemic and I told, you know, now I'm telling kids to get off my lawn, whatever. Like, you know, motivation just, hell, if food motivates you, use it. You know, work until lunch, that's what you, you work until you get your lunch break and then you work again until you get to eat dinner and then you're done. I've done that. <laughs> kind of sad, but I've done it. I feel like a dog because I'm very food motivated and I like attention. My first two years when I was taking classes in Tiang, I had a lot of deadlines. I had a lot of work to do. And so that like, okay, I got to get to this and then I'm good. And then, then that, and then I can relax for a bit and then I got to finish grading this. So like, exactly what he said worked for me my first years and it also worked for me in undergrad because like in undergrad you have a lot of things to do and not many not a lot of time to do it so that worked for me now it's just like since I'm not in classes I'm like oh can't just complain people I gotta just keep doing this that is something that is important too like in grad school you don't take as many classes as you do in undergrad you'll maybe take three a semester three maybe four so on paper, it looks like you have a lot of free time because you don't have a lot of classes and you don't have, then you have less homework. But I feel like you don't actually have a lot of free time too. Yeah, the way that I thought about it, like undergrad, you take a lot of classes and you have a lot of assignments, but they don't take them much time to do. But then in grad school, you have very little classes, very little assignments, but they take you this much time just to get it done. So you're constantly working and you just have to, it's, just figuring out how to pace yourself at that point it's just hard just like how you have to figure out how to pace yourself in undergrad it's just a slightly different way to pace yourself in grad school i will say though on in some aspects like some of your grad school classes will be easier because they're not doing as much like frequent homework assignments it's kind mm -hmm. of just like okay well you do this and this like you take these two tests and then you have a paper at the end of the semester you know mm -hmm. there are classes like that and i've found that to be true especially at smaller universities so you know hey <laughs> but um you know as a general rule you know you have a lot of milestones and you've got a lot of shit you have to do so <laughs> it's it does take a it is a lot different but you'll find yourself working probably just as much on the schoolwork, but you'll also have your other responsibilities because your TA, kind of like having work study where if you work at the universities, you're not, I think it's a federal thing where you're not allowed to work more than 20 hours a week on campus. 
I don't know if you got either of you two encountered that, but like when you get your RA or TA position, you're signing up for 20 hours a week. They say that, you're going to only be doing 20 hours a week, but really that, that, that's not true. Yeah, it's, you're <laughs> paid for 20 hours a week because that's your actual work. The rest is of the 40 hour mythical 40 hour work week is um, classes. So half of it should be classes. Half of it should be either research or teaching related responsibilities. Um, rarely is that the case and rarely will you actually work 40 hours. You'll probably get more like 50 or 60. I think if um, you have the right cohort, group of friends, you have the right advisor, you have, um, you have an end goal in sight and you know how to pace yourself, then it's way easier to keep yourself motivated. Yes. Right, so anyways, uh, pretty much is the, the end of the questions because a lot of them kind of just merged together. So does anyone have any more like questions that merged from anything that they said that they want to ask live from anything at all? Speak up now. We got nothing. We got crickets. You guys can ask me anything. Yeah, uh, right. anything that, it, oh, Nico. Uh, well, I did have one question. Uh, it was in regards to um, Lindsay. Uh, in terms of when you were searching for uh, internships and scholarships, how long that pro you said you mentioned that you found like over you, you applied to over like 30, um, 30 different offers. I was wondering how, uh, how long, like, what was the period that it took to uh, gather all of those 30 options? That took a while. I started looking for internships probably I think around Halloween-ish kind of around there and then um, all of my applications were due like the first of March so it took me several months to gather all that information so um, with NASA it was kind of funny I they do like a rolling application for each season so um, for the, the summer ones they'll start accepting people in January so I started applying early and if I got denied from one from NASA, I would remove that application and apply for something else. So I ended up applying to a lot of NASA ones. Um, but then there were also other applications that Dr. L sent out um, through the BitScans list that I applied for. I also looked for um, internships on the links that I sent in the chat. It, it, it takes a while to find a lot of internships to apply for. Yeah. But um, you just gotta okay. keep your eyes open. For what it's worth, I will, I do kind of want to chime in here because you mentioned the FitScams list. That thing was really, really helpful. Um, but if you're looking, even if it's for like, it, not as much for internships, but if you're looking for, you know, PhD positions or if you're looking for work positions or postdocs or whatever, um, the University of, I think it's Kentucky, runs the climb list. There's someone there that at, yeah, it's at Western Kentucky University. I'll put it in the chat here. It's a listserv you can sign up for. This is where I found my PhD position. It got sent to this and it, I was like, oh, okay, I'll apply for that. Um, so it, and there's, you know, a wide variety of things, um, but you can use that website there to sign up for the, the climb list and it, they have, and it's an international thing. So they have a lot of PhD positions in, you know, California and Oklahoma and Maryland and, you know, other jobs in those places. But you also see, um, and it makes me really jealous, honestly, but there's a lot of positions in like, you know, a lot of UK positions for meteorology, PhD, a lot of, a lot in Germany, like at the Max Planck Institute, you know, Shoot your shot. <laughs> like <laughs> Chris Boykin, another alumni, ended up at the University of Reading, I think. No. I think yeah, I think she's at Reading. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she yeah like they were saying, don't be afraid to apply to international schools too. It might be cool. McGill University in Canada has a, lot, a really good program. Yeah, um, one of one of our alumni went, she's doing her postdoc at um, U University of Edinburgh. And she's like, I mean, I really wish I applied here for school when she was looking for schools because it's a really cool school. There are big differences though between what we're used to in America for universities versus what they do. They don't have 
intramural they barely have intramural sports that they don't do any of like the fun stuff that we are used to as a general rule um as far as school sanctioned that was one of the biggest warnings that my ku advisor gave me when i was applying for phd positions um is that it's it's radically different and they will probably expect a lot more work out of you at one time because their PhD positions tend to last less than four years. Um, I think as far as I know, um, a lot of people end up coming here because you get a little more time and you can do more things. Um, but their, their undergrad degrees are harder than ours, but our graduate programs are supposed to be harder than theirs but their pr graduate programs are shorter. Like they'll cut off your funding after X number of years and they expect you to, you know, be working on that and only that. So, I mean, it's different, but it's definitely an option. Like I, I almost, I was like one of the top five applicants for a, a position at the Medeo France, you know, working with like boundary layer microphysics, doing stuff for them. So it's totally an option. I'd recommend looking into it if, especially if you're interested in kind of the more um, like earth system, global climate system type work, but people do post, you know, random stuff here and there. It's, it's moderated. So you won't get a lot of random stuff, but it could be worth it. It could, you know, it's what got me my position here. So pass it on for someone who might want it. Okay, then. Thank you very much. We do appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any more questions? I do have one question. Yeah, go ahead. You're good. Okay, sorry. I'm, like, at work. Um, so, I was, like, thinking so during COVID, like, it's not easy to, like, I guess, go out and network like it was before. So like how I would typically think of like going and looking for people, like if I wanted to do a master's program, like I went to AMS last year and I was like, that would have been a great opportunity to ask people about like, oh, do you have any openings? Like, are you being funded? Um, but how would you go about that this year? Would you just suggest like emailing professors, like researching them, looking at their work and then asking them that way? Yeah. Um, one thing too that's really cool so I'm, I'm guessing most of you are members of the national ams too so they have all of the recordings from previous meetings that were in person too so if you know a professor that you want to work with or that um you have an idea about maybe you can go look on the ams website to see what they've actually if they had presented at like the national ams or something like you could actually go watch one of their talks too yeah well and one one thing that um i have a, an undergrad friend here that's looking for graduate schools and they're since one of our my friend audrey the hydrogeology grad student she paid for or like the university and her advisor or whoever paid for her AGU attendance fee and whatnot. Um, the undergrad's just gonna like come hang out, you know, cause she's part of our COVID bubble. So um, she's gonna, you know, go hang out and like watch the same talks cause she's, inter she's do interested in doing hydrogeology too. So like if you can find someone that is either going to AMS or has the digital access, however they're doing it, I'm. I'm just avoiding it because I feel like it's going to be a mess. But um, if you can find someone who has that access, you know, get on Zoom or WebEx or whatever and share your screen with them while, you know, the talks are going on or share your login information to see that stuff. But as a general rule, I've found personally reaching out to the professors to be a better option um, because at the conferences, they've got so much going on. They're like AGU has like 50,000 people. Obviously they're not all meteorology, but there's like 50,000 people at this conference center in San Francisco. And then AMS is like, isn't it like 15,000 every year or something like that? Sound about. Yeah. So there's just so many people, so many, you know, a lot of the professors are either on a committee or on one of the presentation boards or 
or their chair something you know they're, they've got other stuff to do the easiest thing is to if you're going to go you kind of introduce yourself and say like hey you know i sent you this email and he's like and i had one that was like oh yeah i remember you i i can't right now but i'll get back to you you know once we get back from ams and i was like perfect thank you you know so those little things can help, but I've found that reaching out and asking professors, you know, do you have a position? Do you have funding? Do you like that kind of stuff tends to be somewhat more effective. And especially during COVID, I think that'll be probably more effective than trying to meet up with them on Zoom somehow. It's easier to schedule a meeting with them for like an interview kind of thing rather than try to be like, oh, hey, I was in your session at AMS when you weren't there so for what that's worth did i answer your question janelle yes thank you so much i appreciate it all right anybody else have any more questions and kate Lindsay loves your cat <laughs> i just saw the comment Lindsay loves your cat my cat loves her too She's trying to get in on all the grad school information. <laughs> oh, I love that. But yeah, anyone else have any more questions? Wow, we this is the longest meeting I've we've ever had. I mean, there's a lot of good information, and I will I have been recording it, so I can post the recording. You can go back and look at any of the information later because this was a lot to take in, especially for people who really haven't looked at grad school before. It's overwhelming at first, but um... that's normal. <laughs> Very overwhelming when you first start looking for grad schools. Yeah. All right. So if there's no more questions, I'm going to end this. And if you if you want to talk to any of them, I'm sure they can talk to you in private. They're all on Facebook. I can. Yeah. You can talk and to them. I can say I still know. I still am in contact with a lot of people that are still at Florida State. So if that's a school you're interested in, I can get you in contact with current students and professors there, too. That's those, and I can try to see if there's any other alumni that went to different schools. I just picked, I picked these three because we have one Florida school, one that's talking about like atmosphere pollution, and Kevin who does everyone else, everything else basically. It's kind of why I did that because I wanted a Florida school with Amanda. Lindsay does like the pollution and like Northeast is, and Kevin's like more central. So I was trying yeah, to get it's a little sad bit of because everything. I'm doing all organic chemistry, and I'm like, where is the meteorology? There's no meteorology. <laughs> like steered so far away from what I did in undergrad. It's ridiculous. So yeah, if there's any other schools, because I know Zach commented that he that he was looking for somewhere when University of Wisconsin. I don't know if they'll find that, but if there's any other schools, let me know or let me. I know someone who went to University of Wisconsin for his master's. He went. He was an FSU undergrad, went to Wisconsin for master's, and then went to actually University of Delaware for emergency management for his PhD. But yeah, I think it's Wisconsin. I know Wisconsin. As the meteorology program they have kind of a their thing i think is satellite remote sensing type mm -hmm. stuff they like they have a lot of they do a lot of processing of satellite imagery for you know like when people link and say like oh look at this cool hurricane picture you know that's a lot of it comes from repositories that they have yeah the guy who wrote the textbook that dr l uses for remote sensing grant petty he teaches at um i don't know if he teaches anymore but he, he advises people at University of Wisconsin. Yeah, but Cassie, I think it's probably fair to say that you can share our, like our school emails. With yeah, I just, yeah, yeah, send me your emails in private. I can send, I can, cause I'm gonna send a summary of the whole meeting out probably the next couple of days. I could put the contact info out too. So yeah. whatever emails you have or I can find how people do that. And while we're talking about emails, I'm literally about to click send on the meeting semester, the meetings for next semester form. Please fill it out. I'm just doing that. I just want to say that now because I'm literally sending it out as we speak. So putting a plug for that. Don't forget to do that. I'm putting the deadline for the last day of finals. So I'll give plenty of time to answer. It'll take you literally 20 seconds. So, all right. So I will get their contact. I'll put that and I'll get this on YouTube in the next day or two so you can watch it back. So. That being said, thank you guys for coming to speak to us. That's much appreciated. It's a lot of good information. Welcome. All right. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, definitely so, feel free to reach out. Yeah. Okay. They're it's very approachable people and nice people. Yeah. And if you've got, <laughs> whether it's questions about grad school or it's questions about, you know, the universities we attend, I think 
we can answer any of them. And most likely, since we don't know, someone at our university will know. And if you want to know about a university we aren't at, someone we know probably went to one of those universities. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's just kind that of works. Yeah, meteorology is actually a very small community. <laughs> All right, cool. So all right, I'm gonna end it. So have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.